and welcome to episode 217 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I would like to say thank you to our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Stacy, Katrina Legger, Maria, Megan E, Louise, Ruth Rose, Samantha Tonge, April Carlson, and Brianna Hunt Holder. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is Dark Harvest. Dark Harvest was released in 2023. It has 5.5 out of 10 on IMDb and 71% on Rotten Tomatoes. Every fall in a small Midwestern town, a supernatural spectre named Sawtooth Jack arises from the cornfields and approaches the town's church, where violent gangs of young boys hungrily await their chance to confront the legendary nightmare in an annual harvest rite of life and death. Richie Shepherd lives in the shadow of his big brother, who won last year's October Prize to get his ticket out of town. To prove himself and join his brother, Richie pairs up with restless dreamer Kelly Haynes, who will do whatever it takes to escape this dead-end town. Against the rules and the odds, Richie and Kelly decide to hunt down the legendary nightmare to win the run and their freedom together. As always, we're going to start with our likes column for today's film review. And what a great plot line for a film. I know that this film was based on a book, right? I know that. I am aware of that. I haven't read the book, so I can't compare the two. But it is a great concept. And I watched this film when I was on my holidays with Nick and Sinead. And you know what? I wasn't expecting anything from it because I didn't know anything about it. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. So the film is just full of this wild, crazy energy. So the teenage boys in the town that are of a certain age are literally starved for three days before the run happens. And there is this real feeling of wildness and frenzy and lack of control when the run starts so the boys are like they're feral they are smashing shit up they are in masks they are ready to hunt down this entity and like rip it to shreds and it feels so full of energy and excitement that as the watcher I was feeling really full of energy and excitement. I was like, oh, what's going on? What's going to happen? And the film is gory, okay? I'm just going to put it out there. It's a gory film, but as somebody who says all the time that they don't like gore, it's not unwatchable and it's not unnecessary because the film doesn't take itself too seriously. In elements of the gore, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like there's this great moment where blood bursts out of this like bomb shelter type thing and it bursts through the doors like the the blood in The Shining, do you know? So while you've got gore, the film kind of nods to the fact that it's OTT and it's a bit silly and that it's just meant to be enjoyable. So Sawtooth Jack is the villain in the story And he's pretty freaky. Like, he is freaky. You see him quite early on. I sort of wondered in the beginning, I was like, is Sawtooth Jack even real? Like, is it a real entity? He is a very real entity and he is freaky. He's got this pumpkin head and, you know, this sort of long, gangly body. And it is, for a relatively low budget film, it is, it's creepy. And I respected that and I appreciated it. I I also enjoyed how the story unfolded and you sort of get this origin story reveal of Sawtooth Jack like where he came from I say sort of well I'll kind of get into a bit more of that later because that also comes under the dislikes column and I can't give away too much because I don't want to give away what happens in the movie but I enjoyed that element of the story and all in all like I, I thought it was fun I really did. I thought it was a fun movie. I was pleasantly surprised. I would genuinely say like, you know, park up, watch it with people, watch it with your friends, watch it with your family. There are also tons of references to the band The Misfits throughout this film. So if you're a Misfits fan, you will love all the Easter eggs and references to The Misfits throughout this film. Which brings me swiftly to our dislikes of this film. Look, I'm just going to say it. Some of the graphics aren't great, okay? And it does take away from the story a little bit sometimes. When I was watching it, I remember being a bit like, ooh, when was this made? In 2023? Okay, interesting. Now look, it doesn't take away from the film as a whole. I'm probably being a little bit nitpicky saying that. 
The other thing that I found difficult was that I wanted to be more invested in the characters. You know what I mean? I wanted to root for them. I wanted them to win. But I felt like they weren't very fleshed out as a whole. And I I also felt like the backstory was not fully fleshed out either, right? I had so many questions, so many questions about, you know, how this run started. Why is it only in this town? Like loads of questions. And it is definitely a horror film where you need to suspend your disbelief. And I have no problem with doing that. If you've got a horror film where you've got this 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 villain that is supernatural and the boys in the town hunt this film villain every year fine like i'm i'm fine to suspend my disbelief and watch that but it's also set in like the 1960s and it's set in the real world in our world so i felt like because of that it needed a bit more information i needed to know like how the run started why it started why is it only teenage boys that can hunt sawtooth jack and how did the townspeople like find out that it was only teenage boys that could hunt Sawtooth Jack? And this is what I said earlier. So we sort of get some information about the origins of Sawtooth Jack, which that part of the story I was I was invested in, right? But we don't get enough. I wanted more. And this might be explored further in the book. Like it might be something that is really fleshed out in the book. And if you read the book, you might go, oh, the reason is this, this and this. But like I said, I haven't read the book, so I can't compare the two. And I also recognize that sometimes with a particular book, you're basically trying to squash all of the elements of the book into an hour and a half. And it doesn't always work out that easily. Right. So I did feel like after watching it that I wanted to go and read the book genuinely I I felt like oh I bet I want to get my hands on that and read it I think it's a young adult fiction book and um, it's called The Dark Harvest it, I, I would feel like it was worth a read and I also feel like the film was worth a watch it was a good film I don't think it lived up to the potential somebody commented that on my Instagram post and I thought couldn't have put it better myself didn't live up to its potential however it was very entertaining I'm giving it three stars So that's three stars for The Dark Harvest. Today's episode is sponsored by Rosetta Stone. If you've been wanting to learn a new language because you took Spanish, French or another language when you were in school and you always wanted to pick it up again, then Rosetta Stone is for you. So as well as learning Irish throughout my childhood, I also learned French in school to a pretty high standard and I am desperate to pick it up again. Rosetta Stone is the most trusted language learning program. It is available on desktop, but it also can be used as an app on your phone or your tablet. Rosetta Stone teaches through immersion. Instead of memorizing and dreading vocabulary words, you learn by matching audio from native speakers to visuals, reading stories, participating in dialogues and other practical language skills to fast track your ability to communicate fluently. Rosetta Stone has been the expert in language learning for 30 years and it's been around for 30 years because it works. It's the most trusted, time-tested app out there. Don't put off learning that language. There is no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, Real Life Ghost Stories listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com forward slash today. That's rosettastone.com forward slash today. You know that's the sound of another sale on your online Shopify store. But did you know that Shopify powers selling in person too? That's right. Shopify is the sound of selling everywhere. Online, in store, on social media and beyond. (coughs) Shopify Point of Sale is your command centre for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. 
Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you to drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system or use Shopify's POS Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Stories, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash Stories to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash Stories. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. This time of year can be a lot and the run up to the holiday season can trigger a lot of negative feelings for a lot of people. For some, it might feel overwhelming, it might make you feel anxious and for others, it might trigger feelings of sadness, of feeling alone and of feeling loss. And if you resonate with any of those feelings, there are some steps that you can take in your life to counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can give you the tools to feel grounded and manage everything that is going on over the holiday period. So I am a big advocate for therapy. I am in therapy every single week. And for me, therapy has been a way for me to unpack stuff that's going on in my life to try and develop positive coping skills. And I think it's really important to say that therapy isn't just for people who've experienced major trauma. Therapy can have a really positive impact on your life no matter what you're going through. BetterHelp is entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible and suited to your schedule, which I think is really important in this day and age. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Visit betterhelp.com slash real life ghost stories today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash real life ghost stories. Which brings us swiftly to our story this week. Now, the information, the source for my story this week is a book called The World's Most Haunted House. The True Story of the Bridgeport Poltergeist on Lindley Street by William J. Hall. I'm not even going to give you a preamble for this one. I'm diving straight into the story. Let's get into it. I like to call myself an open-minded sceptic. I respect people's stories and beliefs, but I also know that sometimes people lie or exaggerate or misinterpret or it's their subconscious reaction to difficult circumstances and so on. There are times, however, that the mental gymnastics needed to find a logical or scientific explanation for a paranormal event become so convoluted and obscure that they seem much less plausible than a paranormal explanation. I am fully willing to believe and accept that there isn't always a logical explanation and that sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. In 1960, Jerry and Laura Gooden purchased their home in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And in 1961, Jerry Gooden Jr. was born, completing the Gooden family. Jerry and Laura were enamoured with their little boy, and it was only when a neighbour commented on his gait that they realised that there was a possibility that he had a medical condition. Jerry Jr. was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, Life became increasingly difficult for the Goodins. They did not qualify for any financial assistance due to the fact that they owned their house. And as Jerry Jr. got older, he was faced with more and more struggles due to his condition. But the Goodins persevered and they worked tirelessly to ensure that Jerry Jr.'s life was as enriched and fulfilled as it could be. On top of the strain of their child's medical condition, Laura's elderly mother came to stay with them. Eventually, Laura and Jerry became unable to look after both her and Jerry Jr. And Laura's mother went to a home where she passed away. In 1967, after a trip to St. Anne's Shrine, Jerry Jr. caught a cold and became incredibly unwell. 
He died on the 26th of September 1967. The day after she buried her son, Laura was hospitalised and had a full hysterectomy due to having a tumour in her womb. In May 1968, Jerry and Laura adopted four-year-old Marcia. Laura was Native American and Marcia was Native American and her family had wanted her to be adopted by a Native American parent. I have purposefully given you a whistle-stop tour of the circumstances that led up to the beginning of the haunting. These people had been through a hell of a lot by anyone's standards and Marcia arriving into their lives seemed to be an absolute joy. By all accounts, Marcia was a pleasant, well-mannered and well-behaved little girl. But also, by all accounts, Jerry and Laura were wildly overprotective of her. They raised Marcia as though she were made of glass. They barely let her out of their sight and Marcia became accustomed to playing alone. When she eventually went to school, Marcia was hideously bullied because she was Native American to the point that she was badly beaten, being repeatedly kicked in the pelvis and ribs by a boy in her class, and Jerry and Laura removed her from school. Of course, any parent could understand doing this, but the impact it must have had on Marcia, it must have been enormous. She was described by her neighbours as a lovely child, who kept all of her anger and rage inside. The haunting started in 1968, not long after Marcia arrived in the Gooden house. She had become friends with the child of a family friend and her name was Rosemary. And this was not an easy process. Marcia really struggled to communicate with Rosemary initially. They would sit silently at opposite ends of the sofa. But in hindsight, this really is where the strangeness started. As Marcia and Rosemary sat on opposite ends of the sofa, Rosemary's end of the sofa would begin to vibrate and shake and it would rise into the air. The more Rosemary reacted or the more fear she showed, the worse it got. The sofa would vibrate, rise into the air and sway slightly and then it would float back down to the ground. Rosemary told her parents and Marcia's parents what was happening. And of course, they dismissed it as childhood games and imagination. Marcia was, for all intents and purposes, a dream child. But Jerry and Laura did notice some odd behaviours. She would sit on the floor in her bedroom speaking in a strange language and would explain to her parents that she was communicating with her grandfather who had passed away. Eventually, when she became more comfortable with Rosemary, she would tell her how sad she was that she was the only child of the nine children in her family that had been given up for adoption. The family made their first call to the police in 1972. There had been a rhythmic pounding in the house, a hammering, that Jerry described as being like stones falling on the roof of the house. Initially, they definitely did not think that the noises were supernatural. They assumed that there was some sort of rational explanation, like a prank. It was getting close to Halloween at this point, and they wondered if it was local teenagers trying to be funny. This was why they eventually called the police. But there was no evidence of a prank being played. In fact, there was no evidence of stones being thrown at the house or of any human intervention at all. The tapping would start lightly and then build up until it was an absolute cacophony. It was unbearably loud. They were advised by the police to record the sounds, which they did. And when they recorded the sounds, the sounds seemed to follow them from room to room. The police, the fire brigade and city officials could not find any source of the sounds. Jerry himself took apart the plumbing in the house, wondering if there was a problem with the pipes. He also thoroughly checked if there was an animal stuck in the walls or in the roof, and there was no evidence of any problems with the pipes and no evidence of any animal activity. The noises continued. They would stop for a week or two at a time and then start back up again. And eventually it wasn't just noises. It was the summer of 1974 when the first apparition appeared. 
Both Jerry and Laura saw a disembodied hand at the kitchen window. And that same night, Laura heard three knocks on the front door. When she opened the door, there was no one there, but there were wet footprints on the front porch. The night was hot and dry, and there hadn't been any rain. On Thursday, the 21st of November 1974, multiple people in the house heard the crashing of glass inside the house. And when they went to check, they realised that a pane of glass had smashed in the master bedroom, but it had smashed from inside the bedroom. That incident seemed to be the precursor to bigger events on Friday the 22nd of November. It was a typical Friday night. Laura was in her recliner and Jerry was in his recliner to the right of her. Marcia was on the ground playing with a puzzle. There were sounds that came from the master bedroom. Laura and Jerry decided to investigate to discover what had made the noise. The window shade had been rolled up and the curtain pole and the curtains were crumpled onto the floor. Nothing too spooky. They pulled the window shade down and put the curtain pole and the curtain back up. But as they turned to leave the room, the window shade rolled up and the curtain pole and curtains fell to the ground. Jerry and Laura looked at each other and decided that perhaps... It was best to ignore it. They returned to the living room to continue their Friday night relaxation when half an hour later they heard a commotion from the kitchen. They tentatively went to the kitchen and again the window shade was rolled up and the curtain rod and curtains were in a heap on the floor. And then the knocking started. Wild and thunderous It seemed to reverberate around the house with no rhyme or reason and then it just stopped. And the silence that descended over the house seemed almost louder than the knocking had been. On Saturday, November the 23rd, the family went on a day trip and returned home at around 4.30 in the afternoon. Marcia was napping in the car and Jerry and Laura busied themselves carrying in groceries. Everything seemed fine until Jerry noticed that Marcia's little television was lying face down on her bed. He was puzzled as to how this had happened but didn't automatically presume something spooky. But when he returned to the kitchen, he was shocked to see dinner plates rising out of the sink and smashing to the floor. They were hurtling towards the floor at such a powerful rate that they were smashing to pieces on the thick carpet. Jerry and Laura were in shock, but out of instinct, Jerry bent down and began gathering up the fragments of plates, and he was lucky that he did. Five knives rose out of the knife block and flew across the kitchen towards him. Jerry threw his hands over his face and dropped to the floor. None of the knives hit him. When the danger seemed to have passed, he moved towards the knife block. The block was screwed to the wall, and he watched as the block was visibly straining to become freed from the wall and when it did, it was flung towards Jerry. He managed to protect himself and block it from causing him any serious injury, but that wasn't all. Their ordeal did not end there. Laura began to scream as the legs of the table lifted off the floor and continued to rise until the table flipped over and the groceries were flung to the floor. Then the refrigerator rose and hovered a good six inches off the floor. It turned to the right and lowered slowly back down. And then the heavy television console tilted and fell and slammed down onto Laura's foot, crushing two of her toes. Blood poured from her toes where the television had hit her foot. Jerry helped Laura sit down and soak her toes in a basin of warm water. He went and brought Marcia back into the house. Jerry sensed a presence in the kitchen, something moving through the room. He heard a thud and when he looked, the table had been tipped onto its side. He put the table back, turned the light off and left the room. Later in the evening, the table was turned on its side again and the family decided to go to bed for the night. Marcia began screaming from her bedroom. Laura and Jerry went to her aid. Her television had fallen from a shelf and onto her ankle. Jerry removed the television. 
Marcia got up to use the bathroom and Jerry and Laura heard unusual sounds. When they went to see what was happening, Marcia was cowering on the floor with her arms over her head to protect her from the objects that were falling around her, including the shower rod, which had become detached and very nearly hit her in the head. The caps had been removed from the toiletries that were being flung around the room. Towels flew from towel rails. The family eventually put the house in order and went to sleep. On Sunday the 24th of November, Jerry went to the kitchen to begin making breakfast. The table was flipped on its side again and the refrigerator had been moved and was now blocking the outside kitchen door. That morning the house was in chaos. Religious artefacts were ripped from the walls and smashed to pieces. The wardrobe in Marcia's room tipped over and clattered to the floor, barely missing Marcia in her bed. The recliners in the living room tipped up and down and the television was rising and hovering in the air. The family ran out of the house and hollered for neighbours to get the police. Officer John Holdsworth entered the home and witnessed the poltergeist activity. Officers Carol Leonzi and Joe Tomek were on patrol when they were radioed to attend to the house. They too were witness to the poltergeist activity. They were joined by two more officers, George Wilson and Leroy Lawson, who also witnessed the activity in the home. And try as they might, they could not find a logical explanation for these events. The house was in such disarray that when the officers first entered, they assumed that there had been some sort of a burglary. Of course, they quickly learned that there hadn't been. The officers literally witnessed the refrigerator rise and hover in the air and move forward and reposition itself in another part of the kitchen. They noted that there was no sound associated with this movement and no vibrations. They checked everywhere around the fridge and even went into the basement to check the floor beneath the fridge and they could not find an explanation. Officer Tomek noted that Laura was visibly upset and distraught. Jerry alternated between confused and terrified. But Marcia was sitting watching cartoons and seemed completely emotionless. The officers reported that there were incidents happening in rooms where they knew categorically there was no one present. At a loss, the police called the fire department and in total, 10 firefighters were dispatched. The firefighters witnessed the strange activity and Jerry noticed that when the activity was happening, there would be a smell of ozone and sulphur in the air and this feeling of static electricity. The firefighters were also at a loss and called their firehouse chaplain, Father Doyle, to see if he could help. The priest arrived and announced that there was an evil spirit present in the house. He decided to perform a simple house blessing and removed his holy water vial from his bag. Each time he reached for the holy water, it would tip over just out of his reach. He eventually put the holy water away and called exorcist Father Alfonso Trebo. A local woman with an interest in the paranormal, Mary Pascarella, contacted Ed Warren. She had attended a lecture given by Ed and Lorraine Warren and thought that they might be interested in the case. They were. And when Ed arrived at the house, he had no problem finding it, as crowds of people had begun to gather outside it to try and catch a glimpse of the paranormal activity. Ed and Lorraine and two priests entered the Gooden home, and poltergeist activity was witnessed, including a heavy recliner that Marcia was sitting in, rising into the air and flipping over, causing her to be thrown to the floor. It is almost impossible to list all of the individual events in this episode as we would be here for days but the paranormal activity was continuous and varied encompassing all of the things that we have already outlined as well as new activity and all the while the knocks and bangs also continued plumbing and electrical inspectors were once again called in but to no avail the fire department inspected a local building site and properties nearby and again there were no answers forthcoming Soon, the news reporters arrived, and that attracted more and more onlookers. It transpired that as well as the physical incidents in the house, there had been reports of disembodied voices. 
The crowds gathered outside the house and reported that they had heard growling around the vicinity of two decorative swans outside the door. Those two decorative swans were also seen to have moved. One of the priests who accompanied the Warrens, Father Bill, was in the basement when he heard an animalistic growling voice slowly singing jingle bells. At the same time, the cat Sam became visibly frightened and skittish. At the point that Father Bill heard the terrifying voice, he could also hear Marcia, Jerry and Laura upstairs talking to police officers. It could not have been any of the family making these sounds. On Monday, November the 25th, 1974, the entities showed themselves to the family in four smoky, hazy figures that seemed to appear before the group that were amassed in the living room playing Monopoly. In a truly bizarre turn of events, Jerry allegedly began reciting Mass in Latin. He was somewhat familiar with Latin, and as an altar boy, he would have heard Masses said in Latin. But according to Ed and Lorraine Warren's crew, he recited the mass perfectly in a voice that did not sound like his. Marcia and Laura were truly terrified. Three police officers were called to the scene and developed a completely different view of the events in the house. Officers Costello, Del Toro and Zawacki entered the house and had heard stories of the poltergeist activity that was wreaking havoc in the humble home. But this is where things take an interesting turn. Officer Costello was in the living room and Marcia was sitting on the green recliner. The recliner sprung up and down and instead of fear being sparked, Laura scolded Marcia and told her to stop messing around. And then Officer Costello saw it. The TV fell from its stand and struck Jerry. He cried out but Officer Costello had seen Marcia stretch her leg out, push the TV and whip her foot back. He made eye contact with her and she immediately looked down. Marcia confessed to everything. She was throwing her voice and was making objects move and break. The police officer seemed satisfied and advised that the Goodins take Marcia for a psychiatric evaluation and not to let Ed and Lorraine Warren back into the house. The chief inspector stated that the case was a hoax. Marcia was brought for a psychological evaluation and was deemed to be fine, obviously distressed at the situation that had surrounded her, but otherwise fine. With the news of a hoax, eventually the crowds that were gathered outside the house began to disperse. But life didn't return to normal for the Goodins. The activity continued. And not only this, but the activity continued while Marcia was not even in the house. A number of times they left the house for the night and returned to the place being trashed and the animals traumatised. No one else had keys to the house. And they just couldn't figure out what was happening. How could Marcia be to blame for these events when she physically was not in or even near the house? Jerry and Laura also knew that they had seen things happen that there was no way Marcia could have been responsible for. Boyce Beatty, Blue Harari and Jerry Solfin from the Psychical Research Foundation and the American Society for Psychical Research arrived to the house to investigate. They began by interviewing the police officers and firefighters that had been called to the house. Jerry Solfin interviewed Inspector Clark, the chief inspector, the man who had officially declared the case a hoax. The interview did not go as anticipated. Clark stated that he had no choice but to declare the case a hoax, as the situation was becoming untenable. Hordes of people outside the house behaving in wildly inappropriate ways, taking up huge amounts of police time and manpower, etc. When his officers said that they had seen Marcia be responsible for at least one of these events, it was enough for him to declare it a hoax. But when he sat down and read the case files from beginning to end, and when he spoke to all of the police officers that had been involved, 
He believed that something inexplicable happened in that house. I think at this point it is important in our story to give an overview of exactly what happened in the house and the timeline. There are so many events involved in this story that at times it becomes confusing. In the book The World's Most Haunted House, The True Story of the Bridgeport Poltergeist on Lindy Street by William J. Hall, there is a chapter that is dedicated to the preliminary evaluation of the Bridgeport Poltergeist by Boyce Beatty. And within that, there is a timeline of the events. I'm going to read you that timeline, just so you get an idea of everything that actually happened in that house. For six to eight weeks in November 1971, tappings, poundings and scratchings on the walls and under the bed of the Godin family occurred. These sounds appeared to have focused on Mrs. Gooden, following her from room to room, even while her husband and adopted daughter were away from the house. Physical events commenced on November the 21st, 1974, when an inside window in the master bedroom broke, shattering glass throughout the room. On November the 22nd, curtains fell. On November the 23rd, the number and violence of events increased. A floor model television set fell and injured two toes on Mrs. Gooden's foot. The kitchen tables and chairs flipped and the curtains and shower rod in the bathroom fell down. The greatest activity occurred on Sunday, November the 24th. The refrigerator moved, the daughter's bureau fell, TV sets fell over multiple times, religious objects flew off the walls, the kitchen table and chairs flipped multiple times, the couch lifted off the floor, reclining chairs fell over and went suddenly into reclined recline position while occupied by the 10-year-old girl, desks fell over, pictures flew off walls, Melmac dishes fell with such force as to break, end tables holding lamps flipped, mirrors fell from walls and a number of these incidents were witnessed by Bridgeport policemen, firemen, reporters, psychical investigators, priests, neighbours, relatives and friends of the Goodins. Because of the publicity, a sociological problem of crowds of sightseers developed. Activity continued on November the 25th in the house and outside of the house. Police erected barriers around the block to control the crowds. Early on the morning of November the 26th, the police announced that the daughter had confessed to creating the unusual events by a hoax. The media carried this story and the crowd control problem terminated. A police guard was maintained on the house and no more activity occurred of the paranormal nature until December the 10th when a bureau in the child's room and the kitchen TV fell over in front of witnesses just after the child had lost a game of checkers while playing with a policeman. On December 11th, the hamper turned over, the kitchen TV fell over, and the stereo set, bureau and sewing machine in the living room toppled over several times. Boyce Beatty was recording an interview with the Goodens at the time of these incidents. The cassette ended up with 18 seconds of hissing sounds during the time when the incidents occurred. The sewing machine fell over again on December 13th. On December the 14th, the family came into the house to find the Christmas tree had fallen with all of its ornaments in one separate pile, and the stereo set, sewing machine and kitchen shelf had fallen. It was a horrifying sight. Later, the kitchen TV fell violently. On December the 17th, a neighbour had been watching TV with the family. Mr. Gooden left with him to walk his dog, and when he was returning in the process of opening the front door... The TV moved and the stereo set, sewing machine, bureau and end tables in the living room all fell over at the same time. The team of Blue Harari and Jeffrey Solfin from the Psychical Research Foundation and Boyce Beatty, a fellow of the American Society for Psychical Research, had their initial interview with the Gooden family on December the 18th. Thereafter, all was quiet until December the 27th, after Boyce Beatty had conducted interviews on the family and left the home. Then the kitchen table flipped a kitchen shelf fell, shades in the girl's room rolled up and fell down, the bathroom shelf fell, a baby picture fell off the wall. The family got some sleep but were awakened by the kitchen table and chairs flipping. The baby picture again fell from the wall of the girl's room. Later in the day, a large Sylvania table model TV fell to the floor and the kitchen shelf levitated and fell, hitting the girl and breaking a sugar bowl. The girl's birthday on December the 28th started eventfully at 12.43am with the baby picture on the wall falling off again. 
On December the 29th, the baby picture again fell off the wall. The kitchen shelf fell onto the table. The living room TV pivoted around. The Christmas tree and the girl's desk fell down. A new sewing machine cabinet jumped. And the TV, hamper, bureau and stereo sets moved. The kitchen shelf again fell off its brackets on the morning of December the 30th. And the shower rod lifted out of its bracket and struck the girl on the head. A TV also pivoted again and a light bulb in a lamp came on by itself. On December the 31st, the kitchen shelf fell again. The kitchen table flipped and the stereo set moved out 17 inches from the wall. On January the 1st, 1975, while Boyce Beatty was present, the living room TV and the stereo set moved counterclockwise, the kitchen table jumped, the baby picture fell to the floor and broke, and two plaster cherubs flew off the wall in the girls' room. Beatty did not personally eyewitness these events. More than 60 different objects were involved in the disturbances and about 10% of them were religious objects. The objects that moved, fell or otherwise were disturbed with the greatest frequency were the kitchen TV about 40 times, the kitchen table and chairs about 25, the living room TV about 25, the reclining chairs about 18, the stereo set about 21, the girls bureau about 13, the kitchen shelf about 12 and the end tables about 12. After December the 18th, when Mr. Gooden put eye hooks into the backs of the kitchen TV and the girls' bureau and wired them to eye hooks screwed to the walls, these items no longer fell. Although the Christmas tree, which he rooted in cement, did fall. And really frustratingly, there isn't much more to the story than that. Um, as is often the case of poltergeist stories, we end up in a situation where the family got to a point, I think, where they were just like, no more, we don't want to do this anymore and stopped engaging with external sources about their house. Nobody seems to know where Marcia Gooden is. So the writer of this book, William J. Hall, I think he prefers to go by Bill. He sought to find her because he wanted to hear her side of the story. And I think her side of the story will be really interesting. But it seems that when she turned 18, she went back to Canada to find her birth parents and didn't go back and never, never went back to the Goodens. And it doesn't sound like anybody knows where she is. But let's go back to the very, very beginning of this story. There is so much trauma in this story. There is so much trauma going on in this story. These poor people, everybody involved, experienced serious trauma. From Jerry and Laurie losing their son, Jerry Jr., at such a young age, which must have been horrendous to, you know, Laura's mum moving in and they weren't able to look after her. She went to stay in a home and then subsequently died. I'm sure there were elements of Laura and Jerry that, that you know, maybe felt responsible for that or maybe felt like, oh, we wish we could have kept her in the house, but they just couldn't. The house wasn't big enough and they didn't have the space to manage Jerry Jr.'s medical needs as well as Laura's mother's physical and medical needs. And they really grieved their little boy. Of course they grieved their little boy. How awful for them to lose their child like that. Especially when it seems like something really simple. Like oh he just got a cold. But obviously his immunity must have been much lower. And that cold was obviously life threatening. And eventually did take his life. There is a section at the end of the book where eyewitnesses are interviewed and give their stories and give their 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 idea of what happened and the things that they witnessed which is really really brilliant but there's one of the priests Father Bill who went into the house with Ed and Lorraine Warren who said some in my opinion truly awful things about Laura as a grieving mother how she you know had pictures of her little boy these colour photographs of the little boy in his coffin and for a lot of people you might think oh that's very strange it's actually not culturally very strange there are lots of places where that is the normal thing to do and that is the done thing to do when somebody dies and he starts he talks about how she obviously wasn't psychologically able to cope with death and she shouldn't have had those photographs and it was a strange thing for her to have those photographs and it was strange for her to still be mourning her son And I felt like if I could reach into the book and punch him in the jaw, that's what I wanted to do. Because nobody can say this is how you should grieve appropriately or this is how long grief should last or you should grieve this way and not another way. Nobody has the right to say that. And it did feel incredibly judgmental. It felt really, really judgmental. Like, oh, Laura wasn't able to cope with the death of her son 
and therefore she is somehow responsible for all of this activity. This poor woman did not choose for her son to die and she did not choose to then be in the centre of a big poltergeist case. Even if she was responsible for the activity, even if I believed this woman had somehow faked, you know, levitating refrigerators or whatever, she did it because she was going through something or it happened because she was psychologically going through something horrendous. Just, it really wound me up the way it was phrased. It really annoyed me. And there was also awful things said about Marcia in the newspapers at the time and in reports of this story. Like, this little girl had such a traumatic time. So she's the youngest of nine children and she was the only child that was given up for adoption. We know from the story that she had told people that this really upset her. Of course it would really upset her. How abandoned would you feel being knowing that you were the only child that was given up for adoption? Not only this, but there were reports that she was neglected while she was with her birth family. And then she goes to this new family who are desperate to do what's right for her. Of course they are, but they end up treating her like she's made of glass. She's not allowed to do anything on her own. She's literally always in the presence of her parents. They are terrified of letting her out of their sight. In interviews with with Laura later, she is completely obsessed with Marcia dying, obviously terrified that Marcia is going to die. And then Marcia does eventually go to school and while she's in school, she's horrifically bullied and really badly beaten by a boy in her class. I mean, there are so many layers of trauma right there. So many layers for everybody involved. You know, for little Marcia, for Jerry and for Laura. There, to me, it just feels like this perfect storm of psychological strain and torment. And like I said in the story, there is evidence that Marcia did fake some of the events. Like there is evidence that she was responsible. Like she kicked over the TV in front of the police officers. She, you know, was caught throwing things around in the bathroom at one point. She would flip the recliner up and down in front of people. And there were numerous times in the story, not just once, where Laura said, can you stop doing that? Because Laura had realised that Marcia was obviously faking some of these events for attention or because... She wanted to impress the adults that were around her. I think it's really important to remember that this little girl suddenly had a house full of adults who were all giving her loads of attention. And that attention was coming from this poltergeist activity. And I think that it is also important to note that she is recorded as saying that she loved having all of these people in the house. And I did wonder about this part of the story and the parallels to the Enfield haunting, right? Because we know that the Enfield haunting is often said to have been a hoax that was perpetrated by Janet and her sister. And for a long time, I would have said the same thing because in later years as an adult, Janet admitted that she and her sister did hoax some of the events. She said a small percentage of the events were hoaxed by her and her sister because they felt this immense pressure where there was all these people coming into the house expecting all these, you know, paranormal poltergeist events to happen and they sort of didn't want people to think they were making it up. So their thinking then, their logic was that they would make up some events in order to prove that the poltergeist was real. And in one way, you can kind of get it. And while, like I said, you know, I would have been one of those people who said no, it was an absolute hoax. But there are people who were involved in that story who have been interviewed years later, photographers, police officers, who said, no, I witnessed things that just it wasn't possible for Janet and her sister to hoax them. And I wonder if it's a similar thing here. Marcia loved having loads of people around the house, loved having loads of attention from adults. And I wonder if she thought, well, this poltergeist activity has all but stopped. How am I going to keep these people around? when I'm going to have to fake some of the paranormal activity in order to keep these people around. And I find it really hard to believe that Marcia could have possibly done all of these events that were recorded, things that were seen by multiple people, but she only got caught that one time when the police officer saw her really obviously kick over TV with her foot. I mean, this is a little girl who is, you know, four years old when this all starts and then you know, it takes place over a couple of years. 
I don't think she's a criminal mastermind. I don't think she's a genius where she's learned how to throw her voice and she has learned how to make refrigerators float and tables tip over when she's not in the room. But somehow it is still a hoax. Somehow there is something that she is doing practically and physically that is causing these things. And according to this officer, Costello, who saw her faking the event. Of course, uh, you can totally understand how this man has heard all these stories. Already he's thinking, really, really a poltergeist. He goes into the house and he immediately sees the little girl perpetrate some of this poltergeist activity. Of course, you're going to be like, well, this story clearly isn't true. He said, this officer Costello, that most of what was reported was actually the aftermath of an event rather than witnessing the event itself. So people would go into a room and a chair be tipped over and they would say, oh, I saw a chair being tipped over. But they didn't actually see a chair being tipped over. They saw a chair on the ground. And that's very different than actually witnessing poltergeist events happening. However, there were also multiple people in this story who witnessed poltergeist events happening. There was one person, one of the witnesses was standing with his hand on a chair. Marcia was sitting in the chair and then he realised that his hand was raising into the air and he physically pushed the chair back down onto the ground. I don't know how Marcia would be able to do that. Is it possible that both things can be true at once? That there was paranormal activity going on, but also is it possible that Marcia did some of this stuff when she saw that things were dying down in an attempt to keep those adults around her for longer. You know, Officer Tomek, for example, went on record to say, there has to be a logical explanation for the things that I saw, but whatever it is, I don't have the explanation. I doubt the Goodins could have caused these things to move. It was my personal observation that they were not even close to objects when they moved. And in the closing chapters of this book... Bill Hall interviews 15 separate witnesses who saw things in the house. 15 separate witnesses. And not only that, he has another chapter then in the book where he interviews people who knew the Gooden family, who knew the street that they grew up on, who had heard stories, etc. So they may not have been direct witnesses, but they were people who had a connection to the stories of the house. All of these people who claim that this story is real, that this is a real poltergeist case. And I wanted to touch kind of briefly on the Warrens, right? So Ed and Lorraine Warren came into this house and um, actually Ed Warren in particular really upset the Goodins according to the story. So when Ed Warren arrived, he made numerous toll calls to numerous media outlets which really upset the Goodins. So after Ed Warren arrived, there was a media frenzy and people who were with the Warrens. So the priests, for example, who were with the Warrens, one of them said, look, I really don't think he should have called anybody. I really don't think he should have approached the press at all for this case. These people were really suffering already. They were struggling. They were terrified. And he was later ordered to pay back the Goodins the money that he spent making phone calls to the media. So it must have been a relatively substantial amount of phone calls and amount of money. Ed and Lorraine Warren apparently were really upset that they weren't invited back into the house. And he, Ed Warren in particular, said that, look, I didn't make any money off this case. I didn't charge them any money. I make money from giving lectures and writing books and whatever. But it could be argued and I would argue that if you want to make money from giving lectures, etc., you need to make sure that everybody knows your name. And in order to do that, you whip up as much media frenzy as you possibly can when you go to an allegedly haunted house, regardless of the suffering that this might cause the family. And they had an awful time. They had a really difficult time. The people, the crowds that were gathered outside the house, like people started shouting abuse at them. Apparently people would just walk in off the street into the house just walk into the house chance in their arm wanting to get a look at this poltergeist and particularly wanting to get a look at Marcia like the 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 media wrote horrible things about Marcia saying that she was part of the occult and that she had all of these witchcraft tendencies and whatever just awful things about this poor child I mean even if she was faking all of this stuff she does not she did not deserve to be treated like that there were moments in the story where 
they'd had to go somewhere, like they'd, they'd want to go somewhere else and trying to smuggle Marcia out of the house and get Laura and Jerry out of the house where people would be grabbing at Marcia, these people on the street. At one point, somebody grabbed her so hard that they ripped her coat pocket off. And like, this is a child, you know, six, seven years old. A- an actual child being treated like that by grown adults is horrendous. And I think it's appalling that Ed Warren arrived to that house, saw these people that were clearly distressed and all of the police officers involved in this case, everybody, all of the officials that were involved, they all said the same thing, that whatever was happening in that house, the family were clearly incredibly distressed by everything that was happening. And I know that my dislike for Ed and Lorraine Warren, I, you know, I've, I've said it many times, but if you walk into a house and you see people that are clearly distressed, your first reaction should not be, let's get the media in here, because that is that is not the right thing to do. That I'm sorry, but that is taking advantage of people in a really desperate situation. While Lorraine Warren was in the house, allegedly she received this mysterious burn on the back of her hand that appeared and, you know, formed into a blister. And um, Ed Warren was like, you need to get out of the house. There's a demonic entity in here. You know, the usual Warren stuff. Later, when Marcia was interviewed by the police, she told the police officers that Lorraine Warren had gotten this burn because she put her hand under the hot tap. Now, you can take from that what you will. I know I have a bias against the Warrens, but I do feel really sad that they came into this household and they did not help these people and actually seemed to actively make things worse. Um, In the end, after Ed and Lorraine Warren were not allowed on the property anymore, the police went so far as to threaten legal action against the Warrens if they if they tried to investigate this case any further. The Goodens actually got a lawyer and they made absolutely no money out of this case except for the money that they got back from Ed Warren for making all those phone calls from their phone. The reason they hired this lawyer is because they didn't want any further publicity about the story. And the lawyer tried to encourage them to make money out of it, to charge money for every story that they told or every interview that they gave about their particular case. And the family refused. The Goodens refused. They did one public interview and they did it without any money. They did it completely free of charge. They didn't want any money for it. And the reason they wanted to do this interview was to take the heat off Marcia so that she would have some chance of living a normal life. And eventually she did go back to school and it seems that for those teenage years she did live a normal life until she was 18 and she went back to her birth parents and that's sort of the last thing that we know about her. So here's what I really think about this story, right? More and more as I've been doing this, particularly with stories like this, with stories like the Enfield haunting, with stories like you know, the story of poor Marcia and her mum and dad's house being ransacked by a poltergeist. I think that two things can be true. I think that children can fake things in order to keep things going, if that makes sense. And I do also wonder if there is a possibility that paranormal activity can potentially happen because there are individuals in the household who are under extreme stress. And it is some sort of psychological response to being under extremely stressful conditions. When the Society for Psychical Research people came in to do their investigation, there was also investigation done into the mental health of the members of the household and their state of mind, which I think is an incredibly forward thinking and important thing to do if you're investigating a case like this. And they described that Marcia was obviously a very sad little girl, that she was very lonely that she had a huge amount of anger and rage and trauma that seemed to be kept inside and that instead of kind of voicing these concerns or traumas or fears or whatever, that she would isolate herself and that she seemed to bury all of her emotions. And then, you know, the descriptions that were given of Laura, her mother in the beginning of this story, was that she was very flighty very prone to falling out with friends, struggled quite a lot to keep friends and that she was very anxious, incredibly anxious and the death of her son then in subsequent years had impacted her hugely and she was terrified that Marcia was going to die. And these researchers that came into the house, they they noted that there was a lot of tension in the relationship between Marcia and her mother. 
Laura and between Laura and Jerry. So within the household itself, there was a huge amount of tension and anxiety and this shared trauma and individual trauma. And they described mother and daughter as being like pieces of flint that they struck together to make this intense energy that seems to have been able to create paranormal activity. I think it was interesting that it was described as there being like a smell of sulphur and ozone in the air and this feeling of static electricity just before anything happened. Because that sounds like to me like something was building up like a thunderstorm. And what was really helpful in this book is that the, the psychical research people, they made a note of everything that happened, every single event and what proximity those events had to both Laura and Marcia. And what they found was that the events seemed to centre around those two members of the household, particularly Marcia. She seemed to be in the vicinity for more of these events than Laura was, but that there was definitely evidence to suggest that for a lot of these events, either Laura or Marcia were in the vicinity. Is it possible that the extreme levels of suffering and pain and trauma that these people suffered created the perfect storm where this psychical energy was released between them somehow and it caused things to happen in the house, objects to move, banging sounds, knocking sounds, that other people witnessed these events. Is it possible that it's psychokinetic? Is it possible that this is something that is, you know, happening in people's brains and they're making these things happen? If the things that happened in this story happened the way they are told in the story, then it is difficult to believe that this was entirely a hoax. I would like to know your opinion. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to send in your spooky story, you can do so by emailing it to Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, the source for today's episode was The World's Most Haunted House, the true story of the Bridgeport Poltergeist on Lindley Street by William J. Hall. If you are desperate for extra spooky content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time.